We would like to continue with Sean Metcalf. Welcome, Mr. AD Security Org. It's very nice to have you here. Uh, it's a pleasure um, to host your talk. Uh, I would spare a further introduction and give the word to you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Bonjour, guten Tag. That's the extent of French and German that I know. So the rest will be in English. I hope that's OK. Uh, I'm Sean Metcalf. This is from Workstation to Domain Admin, uh, why secure administration isn't secure and how to fix it. Uh, short title is Securing Administration. So I'm Sean Metcalf. I'm the founder of Trimark Security Company. I've spoken at a number of conferences. This is my second time uh, speaking at Troopers. I'm very happy to be here. I love the concept and the the implementation of the Active Directory security track. A lot of people like that as well. Um, I'm a security consultant and researcher, and I post a lot of information on adsecurity.org, which hopefully, raise your hand if you've heard of it at least. OK, so like half, that's good. Thank you. Um, let's get right into it. So we're going to talk about the current state of administration, the evolution, where we've come from, where we're headed. Uh, the things that a lot of organizations are doing now that they think are secure, and I'm going to break down the reasons why they aren't and what really needs to be done. Because ultimately, attackers find a way to domain admins. And then you have a situation where the dinosaurs are running loose and it's just a disaster. The current state of security is a situation where many organizations have upgraded their security. They have better security tooling. They have event logging alert. events from Windows into a SIM, which I think is a huge win, because traditionally, We've had only the perimeter devices, the firewalls, the web proxies, network devices flowing into the SIM. And for those with Splunk, that's usually like 90% of what ends up going into Splunk. And then the poor Windows security people are like, can we get some Windows security events in? And the Splunk folks are like, no, we're already at 90% of our ingestion rates. We can't do that. That's a problem. Uh, we need to get better at that. Because ultimately, the battle's being fought on the workstations. And those are usually Windows, which means that we need those security events from Windows devices into our SIM so we really understand what's going on. But we're doing vulnerability scanning, and we have software security agents, which can be good or bad, depending on what we've deployed. But the ultimate problem, the biggest issue, is many organizations have not fixed or changed the way they manage Active Directory, the way they administer the system. So let's go back to the beginning. We had our user with a workstation. It was very happy. Just the user could do whatever they wanted. They installed their own software. They set up their own printer. Very happy. Not a problem. Uh, but they were still using an older version of Windows, so maybe they were not so happy. Then we added desktop support. So now we have some other people that can manage and administer that system. And then we said, well, it doesn't make sense for someone to walk around and actually install patches on all these systems. So we added agents for patching, a, a patching system. And then we got to the point where we have this big control center of all these different agents, of all these different systems that manage all of our workstations and, and servers and systems that are out. But we end up in a situation where we have one workstation with 30 accounts in the local administrators group, 50 accounts with local admin via the software management system, 20 accounts with control of the computer via the security agents, and about 100 accounts in the organization that have effective admin rights in the workstation. So depending on your perspective, this number is low, hopefully not, or it's high. Um, this is about an average of what I've seen uh, in organizations of, of various sizes. Any agent that can install or run code is of concern. Because we don't really understand who has control of these workstations, what accounts do. Pen testers and red teamers obviously take advantage of this, leverage this to, the, to their benefit, as do attackers. So the way the administration has, has occurred and is managed has evolved as well. We've gone from things from like VNC to RDP, we do a lot of run as, and then use the Microsoft Management Console, the MMC, locally. And in the beginning, there were admins everywhere. Uh, every local administrator account has the same name and password. And some environments had as many domain admins as users. They just decided, you know what, you're a user on this environment. Let's make you a domain admin just in case we need to do some maintenance at the end of the day. And the people who are designated the AD admins, they're out. Or we just need to shut down the DC for the weekend because there's a power outage. Or we just need to restart it. We'll just make everyone an admin handle that. That way we're, we're, all, we're all in this together, right? We can trust everyone. 
But this resulted in this very target-rich environment with multiple paths to exploiting the environment. And these traditional methods are ripe for attack and compromise because these admin credentials are everywhere. The old school admin methods of logging onto the workstation as an admin, the credentials go in LSAS. Running re run as on the system, credentials go in LSAS. And then we RDP to the domain controller or the admin server remotely. And then the credentials end up in that LSAS. And of course, we can use Mimikatz to pull have admin rights on that system. Now, organizations have realized this. They, they've, they've gone to newer, more secure uh, administration methods, right? Uh, now we don't use the MMC locally. Well, actually, they still do. But a lot of organizations have shifted away from that. So that's good. And there's not as much run as, hopefully. So that's good. So how do we secure our, our administration now? Well, our admins are logged into their workstation as a user, which is good. And they use RDP to connect into an admin server to then perform their administration. This means that those credentials would be on that system and not on our local system. So that means tools like Bloodhound are not going to see that an admin is using that workstation to RDP into another one because their credentials are not on that system, which is good. And maybe they're using MFA, something like Duo, to protect that RDP session. Or perhaps there's a password vault like Secret Server or CyberArk that's in use that's actually managing the credential, that admin, the domain admin credential. So that way, the person themselves don't know it. They don't have to create that admin1234 password. Uh, the system itself manages it. But even with this secure method of administration, there's a number of ways to exploit this, take advantage of it. So here we have our regular user account on the system. And our admin is going to connect into our server, in this case, our domain controller, in order to administer Active Directory. Well, what's very interesting is once this admin does that, again, they're logged on to their regular user workstation with their regular user account, and then RDPing into their domain controller to perform administration with their domain admin account, is that once they do this, there's a very odd file that gets dropped onto the C drive. And it's this underscore one.tmp file, which no one seems to notice. But what has happened in the background that the admin didn't realize is that there was a WMI system, anytime mstsc.exe is run, there's a key logger that's run under the guise of sccmhealthcheck.ps1. And so this is just using a standard power exploit function called gets keystrokes, which is looking for keystrokes whenever it's uh, invoked. And it gets logged to a file much like any key logger and continues and continues and continues. But well, we can use PowerShell to very easily and quickly parse through that and identify what's been typed into RDP, which is a problem. Well, there's some organizations that said, you know what? We're going to protect our admins with smart cards. We're going to go ahead and do that RDP with a smart card. And that way, there's no passwords on that system. This is secure, right? Because there's no password or anything like that. Well, if you were in Vincent's session just before mine, uh, we know that that's not the case. Certainly, the smart card pin can be extracted pretty easily using a number of methods, Mimikatz being one of them. And once we have that pin for that smart card, does that admin ever really remove that smart card from that system? Probably not, which means that it's, it's configured there. And they, the, the attacker on that system can leverage that smart card that's already in place with that pin in order to do actions on behalf of that admin. So we can also look for what I call hidden admin and AD rights by looking at group policies. Group policies are a gold mine in most organizations, especially when we're looking at the default domain controller's policy. Because this is the group policy that is created by default and linked to the domain controller's OU. And it's almost never changed. There are some software packages that want to update this. And I've heard that they have. But no one goes back and checks these. We don't use the default domain controller's policy. We have another policy that we use. Well, I found a lot of interesting things in this, in this default domain controller's policy, especially in the user rights assignment, because they are rarely checked. Why are they rarely checked? Because it looks like this, and that's a lot to look through. So let's hit a couple of these. Allow logon locally. This is logon locally writes to the domain controllers. And we have domain users that has been configured with this right. Why would a domain user ever need to log on to a domain controller? I don't know. Uh, in the past two years, I found this about, I don't know, 10, 15% of the time. 
And one of the customers that I talked to about this said, no, that's not the case, and ran out the door. So we're all sitting there waiting. And this person came back in and was like, because sure enough, he was able to log on as a domain user to his domain controller. And his domain controller was obviously in a place where he could get to pretty quickly because we weren't waiting that long. So the question about this is, why would a domain user ever need to log on to a domain controller? No, there's no good reason. But it got configured at some point along the way and was forgotten about, was never seen again. Okay, this means that they have to get onto the console itself. So at least there's that, right? Well, what if we can gain remote local access? We have virtual DCs, right? Most are virtual, so we can use a VMware console or a remote virtual console. Or if it's physical, we can use something called ILO, uh, at least on HP servers. This out-of-band access to our servers, which should be on a separate network segment switch network entirely. Uh, it's not always the case. And a couple years ago, uh, the Airbus security team started digging into what ILO actually is and discovered a vulnerability which got patched. Of course, the problem with this is who actually patches the firmware on their servers once they've deployed them? Why don't we patch them? Because the server's working just fine. We don't want to mess with the firmware unless the vendor says you have to. Who even notices that there's a critical vulnerability in the out-of-band access management uh, process or component of the server and thinks about updating that. And this attack on this was, was pretty simple. You just send it a bunch of A's and it would overflow it and then you'd have access to ILO without any kind of authentication. So ultimately this vulnerability was brought to you by the letter A. <laughs> but it doesn't stop there. They dug into ILO even more and HP released a patch just last summer with more issues that were highlighted and identified by the same Airbus security folks talking about all of this. Their GitHub is at the bottom. These slides will be on adsecurity.org later. Uh, definitely read through this if you have physical HP servers or if you pen test your red team against environments with servers uh, because this is a big issue. And so they went through and published a number of different vulnerabilities or, or talked to HP to get these patched ranging from just authentication bypass to remote or lo local code execution to actually pulling data directly from memory, which is kind of a problem, especially when you're talking about a physical domain controller. So I went through and summarized all the things that the Airbus security team identified in ILO from uh, compromising the host server operating system through DMA, uh, discovered RCE to exploit an ILO 4 feature which allows read write access to the host memory and then inject a payload into it, uh, a vulnerability in the web server to flash a backdoored firmware, use of DMA communication channel to execute arbitrary commands on the host system. And then this is my favorite one, ILO 4 or 5 chip channel interface. Uh, they could make this work even though ILO is set as disabled. And then there was supposed to be an integrity which they discovered a logic error last year in, which was supposed to solve a lot of the issues, which of course didn't. Uh, and then the Airbus folks have uh, provided a Go scanner to discover vulnerable servers running ILO. So what's the takeaway from this? Patch your firmware on your HP servers and others, uh, especially if you're using ILO or features, or even if you're not, maybe uh, take a look at it to see what that exposure is. Because again, if you have configured local access to users, or server admins thinking that they will only ever log on to your server console, there may be other uh, ways around what you think are core security controls. And then of course, maybe you just added server tier three to the, have the ability to log on locally and log on through term terminal services, which means that they can just log on to your DCs anyway, uh, because that might not be what you want to have actually configured. And who's in server tier three? Well, we have Eddie in tier three. Why is Eddie in tier three? No one really knows why Eddie's in server tier three. <laughs> he had to manage a server one time, so it seemed like a good idea. And then people didn't realize that server tier three had the ability to log on to domain controllers. So Eddie, a regular user, can now log on to our domain controller. And that's bad. Then there's another interesting uh, user rights assignment called Manage Auditing and Security Log. You might be familiar with this because Exchange needs this right for some reason. Uh, but Microsoft notes that anyone with this ability has the right to clear the security log. In a few environments, I've seen this configured where 
a large number of users had the ability to clear security logs on workstations. Seems like a problem. Or on domain controllers, which seems like a really big problem. So another way that we can secure administration, which has been around since Active Directory has been released, is by configuring our logon workstations or our logon hours. These are explicit whitelist configuration of these are the workstations or computers that this account is allowed to log on to. These are the logon hours, the schedule in which this account is allowed to log on. No one really ever does this. Why? Because that means we have to identify all of the systems or the exact times that an admin is actually going to performing, uh, perform administration or need to log on. Uh, most often, I've seen these configured with honey tokens or accounts that really aren't supposed to do anything but are added to privilege groups. So attackers are looking for this as well. All right, so we know that username plus password connecting to a server is probably not the best thing, way to do it for RDP. So we'll just MFA the RDP, and that way it's MFA'd, so we're good. Authentication, we're gonna do the same exact thing, and this time we have our nice little MFA system here, and we're going to connect to our RDP server, and then all of a sudden, we have two back-to-back -back MFA requests. I've already hit accept to the first one. What is the second one from? Or maybe I'm connecting in through ADFS through my federation system and I get the same thing. And I don't really realize that I'm just tapping because yes, I'm tired, I haven't had my coffee yet, it's 8 a.m., I need to get onto the system. Or how about if I haven't even unlocked my phone yet and I just get a prompt like this, but it happens a few times. Is this a hiccup? Is this someone monitoring and, and trying to get an MFA collision with me at the exact same time? Would this get reported if someone saw this? Maybe. Okay, let's talk about ways that we could subvert the MFA process. And I found this configuration at a customer site and I thought this was unique. Unfortunately not. So let's say that Acme company, generic size, has enabled the users to update several attributes through a self storage portal. This is pretty common where users can update their uh, address, their work address, their mobile number, and some other specific attributes that are important for them that they know. Um, let's say they got a new phone, they need to change their number for whatever reason. So they go in and they see their mobile phone number is, is there, so they change it. And this is all handled through Active Directory integrated authentication, so they just hit the portal site and it authentication happens in the background automatically for them. Well, the thing that I've noticed is a lot of organizations use their user configured attribute, which is their cell phone number, for their admin's MFA configuration. So what this means is that if an attacker is on this system and connects to this portal through a hidden browser window, they can update this mobile phone number without anyone noticing. And once they do that, then they have a way to backdoor MFA because every MFA system that I've seen has the enter passcode configuration, but even better, it's text me a code, which uses the cell phone SMS or text message as a backup to your standard MFA push or the uh, code that gets presented. So I was able to do this pretty easily and no one noticed. I used a phone, a cell phone that was mine instead of one owned by the organization. And when I went through this process and leveraged that as an MFA, uh, there was no notification to the user and nobody noticed. And it's, like I said, it's not just Duo, it's others that have this MFA process as well. So ultimately, all the attacker needs to do is drop onto that system where the user is, update that web portal that has their mobile number, change it to their own controlled mobile number, whatever that is, and then subvert the MFA system by using a text message, which you can turn off, which I do recommend you turn that off. But there is another interesting thing about specifically how Duo MFA works. There's this first install option here, bypass Duo authentication when offline, which is fail open. By default, it's failed closed. So that means that if it can't connect to its Duo system through this DNS lookup, it won't let you authenticate to the system. So you could do a denial of service, but the other way to do it is if you had access to the system at some point, you flip this switch so it fails open, and then what happens is you just deny that system from being able to ever connect to that Duo security address. And thanks to Noopy, I, uh, learned about this and also Jared for the hat tip. This is pretty interesting because again, when we think about MFA, we often think that this is a thing that protects our accounts. But we need to think about the second and third level effects of this. 
if we rely on this security control to protect us, we have to ensure that we understand the limitations of that security control. A lot of organizations have deployed Duo, which is good, but again, what are the additional things that, that could happen? Then there's another option right here, which is only prompt for Duo authentication when logging in via RDP. So if we check this, this means local accounts can authenticate without using MFA as well. So if our Duo configuration is changed, who would know about it? The other thing that's interesting about MFA is there's usually an onboarding process where someone goes in, hits a website or a portal, does the request, and then goes through the process. And a lot of times this is automated, which means that I get an email, I just have to go ahead and click on this link. Okay, well, if an attacker has control of my system, they have control of my email, which means they can also get this link before I see it, which means that they might be able to add another MFA token to my account without me knowing about it. So when we talk about MFA onboarding, you want to make sure that there is at least one part of the process where someone has to do something outside of an automated process or through the system, where they have to show their badge and prove that they are the person. Uh, I changed phones recently. Uh, one of my customers have MFA. I sent them a message through their Slack system, and guess what he did? He said, you have to call me. I need to know that you are who you say you are to prove that this is, this is uh, correcting and, and updating the MFA. So yeah, absolutely use MFA. It's good to use. Uh, it's a, an additional protection. And it does have value. We want to MFA everything that we can, especially when we're talking about cloud accounts. This is not a cloud-specific uh, talk. But certainly, if you have cloud administration accounts, please make sure that MFA is enabled for those. Just don't count on MFA to be the silver bullet for security because there are limitations to any system. And what I see a lot is a customer will say, we, we have this security control. And a lot of paper audits go, check. So we want to go beyond what that paper audit says and go, OK, that's great. But what are the limitations of that? What are the ways around that? How do we actually have that configured? What are, what are the conditions and configurations of that? So we can understand what the potential limitations are of it. All right, so there's also password vaults. Um, enterprise password vaults are, are becoming a lot more popular. CyberArk is certainly the, the largest of, of the companies that have the enterprise password vaults and have expanded beyond just that niche. Uh, they're being deployed, deployed more broadly, so that way what was originally for primarily managing service account passwords, now we're managing AD admin and domain admin credentials. Typically, CyberArk or Thycotic Secret Server, although like I said, most of what I see is CyberArk. And there's usually a reconciliation account for the system that's in domain admins. This reconciliation account will automatically reach out to an account, check to make sure the password is still valid that it's managing. If it is not currently under control and the password's been changed outside of the system, then the password vault system will reach out and change it to a password that it knows. And it will note that and move on. And there's additional components uh, to augment security, such as a session manager, which is when you connect to the password vault. And it, it works basically like an RDP proxy. You connect to that, and then you connect directly to the system. You never see the username. You never see the password. So let's see what this looks like. There's a couple different scenarios here that are interesting. We have our workstation, we have our password vault, and our admin server. Traditionally, we've had the workstation connect directly through the admin server via RDP. This is not that much different. So we connect to our password vault and we check out our password. So we're connecting to that website through HTTPS so it's secured. And then we're going to copy that password down. So that password is now um, copied onto that workstation. We can paste it into the RDP logon window and then connect into RDP. This way we don't have to look at that long 30 character string of random characters and type them in manually, get it wrong, get it wrong, get it wrong, lock out the account. So we're going to copy it, paste it, and we're good to go. Of course, there's an issue here because we're using a regular user account on a regular workstation in order to gather this, this information. There's another power exploit function called get clipboard contents, which is a way to pull data out of the Windows clipboard, which is what happens when you copy data using control C or copy. And so again, there's another file here that gets dropped onto the system when it notices that there's an uh, either uh, actually, the, probably the best way to do it is when the title of a web browser says CyberArk, we just kick this off. Because probably someone's going to be copying uh, contents into the clipboard. And once we do that, we can identify some interesting uh, things that, that end up in the, in the clipboard through this 
power supply function. And so with that, we can leverage that information in order to connect into that system at the same time. We can also use another power exploit function called get time to screenshot, uh, which enables us to identify, even if we just have the password, what credentials are actually going to be used if they're stored. We can also extract that from the registry if we really want to. So that's one way that it can be done, checking out the password. The second method that is often configured is, as I mentioned, that system manager or RDP proxy. This is where the password vault is the jump system to perform the administration with zero knowledge of the account password. There is a enterprise password vault vendor that says this is what you should do and you don't need admin workstations, which I completely disagree with. Why? Let's find out. So again, we're going to connect to the password vault via HTTPS, so it's secured. And we're then just going to click connect and go right through to the admin server via RDP. Simple, right? No, nothing ends up on the workstation. Seems very secure. I don't see any problems with this. But I have some questions. What account is to log on uh, to the workstation? And what account is used to log on to the password vault? I'd say nine out of 10 times, it's the same account. So the user account has access to gather the privileged credential data that's in the password vault. And I'd say probably about 60, 70% of the time, that's protected through MFA. Maybe. Hopefully. So we look at the process and we say, OK, well, that's interesting from the authentication method, but who administers that password vault server? Based on what I've seen, a lot of times this password vault server, which stores privileged credentials for Active Directory domain admin accounts, is just in the server's OU, managed by the server's team with the same group policy managing it that manages all the other servers. Because our password vault server is just like any other, right? It's not like it's a domain controller that has credentials. And then the other question is, are the network communications limited to the password vault? Nine times out of 10, the entire network is able to connect to the password vault web server or website, which again, has some concern. And then probably the part of this that I think is, is the most interesting is this part right here, this, this whole part right here. Because how do they connect to the password vault? It's a website. So why don't we just try compromising the user's web browser? Because what web browser are they going to use to connect to CyberArk? The same one that they use to go on Facebook and Reddit and all the other stuff, right? Maybe, hopefully not. But if we're able to get onto the system and have admin rights to it, we could drop in another extension, like maybe this one here. I'm being very subtle, by the way. And if we're able to do this and add an extension, we can watch all the traffic goes, goes back and forth with this web browser, which means we don't need to do anything else. We can just kind of piggyback into that session. And like I said, if we're looking at the password vault administration, we can go through and look to see who the, the uh, users are. And there's Eddie. Damn it, Eddie. Eddie has all the rights in this organization. There's, a, there's usually one. Uh, which means that our dinosaurs are running loose. And even if we have everything else done right, if we're not protecting who has administrative rights to our password vault, there's a problem. The other thing I find very interesting is that people put these on the internet. Uh, so I ran some Shodan searches, and I saw that there were CyberArk systems that were on the internet. Um, a few of them, actually. And, and one that's kind of old. Uh, which is a problem, which I'll talk about in just a minute. But there's a number of these weaknesses that I've discovered as we're working with customers that have gone all in on password vaults. And I've actually talked to some uh, CyberArk uh, consultants after I've talked about this at other conferences. And they said, yeah, we talked to our customers about making sure they do the best practices. And I said, well, I don't think the message is getting to them because this is the way I keep seeing things configured. Uh, because these, these are pretty common. And then, of course, the big one at the bottom if, is if there's a vulnerability or a way to get into the password vault, then that can result in Active Directory compromise. So hopefully there, there has not been any kind of vulnerability in any kind of password vault and that they're very aware. <coughs> OK, yeah, that's bad. So last year, um, there was a uh, red team uh, from <coughs> Germany that identified a security vulnerability in CyberArk that was a way to bypass authentication and actually get RCE into it based on the 
uh, REST API and the way that the, the tokens were being handled as part of that. Uh, so very complicated method of doing it, but effectively they created a malicious serialized.net object and passed that into that connection. So when I talk about limiting who has the ability to connect to the, uh, the CyberArk web server or your password vault web server, there's a really good reason for that. Because it was very nice of this, this team to let CyberArk know about it and get this fixed. But I'm pretty sure that the uh, nation states are not as generous in their um, uh, sharing of, of zero days. So when it comes to enterprise password vaults, there's some best practices. We want to make sure that our administration is secure. We want to make sure that only uh, admin accounts can manage that. We want to make sure that we restrict access to this. We treat it like a domain controller, ultimately. And then the secu we secure that authentication. What we recommend is not using a user account, the regular user account, to get those credentials. Uh, we recommend don't use your admin account to get those credentials. Uh, we talk about the concept of a transition account. It's another account that has no rights, and the only thing it's ever used for is to get those credentials. Uh, MFA that account, and that way there's some additional protection there, especially if you're using a, a user workstation. Um, there's some other things that could be done when you're using an admin workstation. But we want to ensure that there's, there's a tiered process of how to get access to those credentials, and there's not just a, a way to jump right into it. And then certainly split out the roles to separate servers when possible. Uh, CyberArk has their agent that reaches out to change the password on systems, uh, that regularly reaches back and talks to the vault. If the web server is that server, then that's a problem. Uh, CyberArk says not to do that, but a lot of times organizations will have one server that has all the roles on it that does everything. And that server, of course, is in the server's area where the server admins can manage it. So the question I get a lot is, well, what about the admin forest? What about the red forest? What do, why don't we just do that? So the whole concept of this is we have our production forest over here on the left, and then over here we have our enhanced security administrative environment, aka red forest, aka admin forest. I just like admin forest because it's easy to say, other than ESA, however you pronounce that. So the whole concept of this is that you're going to set up a brand new forest with only physical servers with PKI, separate patching, separate administration. Uh, all of your admins for your production environment, they have regular user accounts in this environment. They can't modify anything. And any of those people that want to administer or need to administer this admin forest need to have a second account with another PKI smart card. So the whole concept of this is it's entirely isolated, protected, and it's extremely difficult to get access to those accounts or that environment. I think I've covered all of that pretty much. Um, patch quickly, run the latest versions of Windows on the workstation and the server, um, making sure that everything is limited. And then on the production side, we, we basically empty out our admin, our AD admin groups, and just leverage those, those uh, that AD admin group, or that, sorry, that, that admin force group. There are some pros to this, because it effectively does isolate those domain admins and other Active Directory admins. And when deployed properly, it can be effective in limiting an attacker AD privilege access. But there are a number of cons, a number of negatives, a number of drawbacks to this. Uh, it's very expensive to deploy. First of all, you typically have Microsoft come in to do that, which means you give them a big bag of money, um, usually several big bags of money with the dollar signs on the side, or euros, I guess, here. Um, it in great, greatly increases the management opera operational overhead and costs. Um, now all the admins have to use this system. They have to use admin workstations associated with that. There's a management tail of that whole environment, which is very expensive to manage. So the, it's very expensive to deploy. It's very expensive to manage. But at least all of your Active Directory admins are over in that, right, uh, that environment now. Uh, you've duplicated your infrastructure. Uh, the biggest issue is it doesn't fix your production AD issues. I've seen many, many, many times security issues that I've highlighted in production environments and they had an admin force. They had a red force. Because Microsoft or someone else talked to the CIO and said, write this check, this will solve your Active Directory security issues. And they said, okay, I wanna write that check. And later, it's still an issue. Why is that still an issue? Well, we haven't resolved the expansive rights over workstations and servers because we know that there's workstation admins that has admin rights to all workstations server admins that have admin rights to pretty much all our servers, including our CyberArk password vault. 
and our AD admin accounts may not be properly discovered. If we're only looking at our group membership, especially our privileged group membership in Active Directory, our default ones like domain admins, which is what everyone looks at, we're not going to capture all of our Active Directory admins. If we have to look at our group policy, we have to look at permissions in AD. We have to have a good understanding of, of what those rights and those, those accounts are. And then there's this like other thing that people forget about, these things called service accounts that often are members of domain admins that no one wants to touch ever. Why? Because they were set up years ago. No one knows really what they do. They just know, don't touch this. Don't change this password. Don't do anything with this. I mean, attackers know when there's an admin force. You're going to see something like this that shows up. It's going to have a one-way trust. Um, oftentimes, it'll have some additional security configuration on it. Um, it's not that difficult to find and discover because, again, there's usually group membership uh, from this, this other forest so that we know that there's something else there that looks interesting. Um, we can do that through our standard uh, PowerView uh, commands in order to identify what's there. Um, or we can use uh, other, other PowerShell to look for it. But we're going to see that there's a one-way trust and that is configured for this admin forest. And again, anytime we see something like foreign security principles, that's going to be uh, something from another forest, and we can see here that that's what it is. So via the GUI or via PowerShell, we can discover this pretty easily. So once we realize that there's, there's all of our admins are over in this other uh, forest, we're going to start looking for low-hanging fruit, things that are still available to us. And there's one thing that's always going to be available uh, that you can't just outsource to another admin forest, and that's backup. Domain controllers have to get backed up one way or another. Um, a lot of times they're backed up through a system that backs up everything in the environment, which seems problematic to me, but it makes sense when you talk about how to back, and back up and recover things through a process, standard process. And so here we have a membership of the Active Directory Group backup operators. We have a backup server and we have a backup account. So if we have a backup server with AD backup rights and we have an AD backup service account, we're going to go after one of these. And it's very likely that this backup service account has a very simple uh, password, something like backup AD 2019, or probably more likely 2014. Um, and it's not going to be that complex uh, as, as far as a password goes or have a lot of restrictions on it, because and it may even be a member of domain admins, which is kind of scary. Uh, there are some backup products that require domain admins or some, some level of rights uh, at that level because it's able to restore attributes back to the way it was before. And in order to do that, it needs elevated rights. So the challenge with this is we need to back up domain controllers. We need to have a service account. We need to have a system to do it. But by doing so, especially if we're using something like net backup that backs up everything, then that becomes our entry point to that. I worked with a red team, um, internal red team recently, and they had a, an admin force in their environment. And this is how we exploited their Active Directory. We went through the backup server, we jumped onto the DCs, and we just waited. And then we did some other fun stuff in the admin force, which I can talk about later. So did you know that the Splunk Universal Forwarder is often installed in domain controllers? And that it's effectively a mini version of Splunk and can run scripts? So. This is a fascinating uh, talk that from uh, the Splunk conference, talking about the Splunk deployment server and how you can push things to systems that have Splunk agents running on it, specifically the universal forwarder. I personally do not like agents that can install and run code on domain controllers, but I also understand the operational component and how things have to be managed. So exploiting the production AD with an AD admin forest, um, there's a lot of problems in the production AD forest that don't get fixed with an admin force, which is why I'm not a huge fan of an admin force, except for very specific circumstances. Um, usually large environments with multiple force, it makes sense to have a single admin force to manage those others. Outside of that, it's a huge additional cost with benefits that have to be evaluated carefully. One of the other problems we see a lot is cross-forest administration. So we have forest A and forest B because I'm really creative at naming forest. And so Forest B is going to have a trust where it trusts the users in Forest A. And so there's our ad happy domain admin in Forest A. And our happy domain admin is told, guess what, domain admin? We have this new forest called Forest B. We want you to manage that also. Really? 
Don't I have enough to do? Okay, sure. So our forest A takes their forest A uh, domain admin account, and they're gonna make sure that it's a member of the forest B uh, administrator so that they can go ahead and RDP and manage that with one account because that makes things easy. They got this dumped on them on a Friday, and they have to make some changes in forest B. Okay. The problem is that even with a one-way trust, we now have a situation where if Forest B is compromised and Forest, a domain, Forest A's domain admin account is on that domain controller, it's compromised also. And so the compromise of Forest B can jump back over to Forest A. So you can expand this to Forest B is your DMZ. Common scenario. How is that being administered? One of the biggest challenges that AD admins have is I've got these forests because now I've been told to set up these forests so I have trust so I can manage them. So I use my production AD admin account because that has a long password, it's got MFA, it's got all the other stuff that I'm supposed to be using, maybe. And that's the one that I keep track of. I don't want to keep track of five different admin accounts. But this is the way it ends up happening a lot of the time is we have this trust <laughs> because Microsoft said to create trust, so we create trust. We made it easy on ourselves. But with this ease of use, we have the problem, where we end up with a full compromise of the production because the DMZ was popped. We're using the same account to administer it. So ultimately, the best way to mitigate this is to ensure that any of these external forests outside of a production AD forest have their own accounts inside them that are used to manage them. Let's not use cross-forest groups in order to manage systems because that just makes it more complex from the perspective of who has rights to what. Um, I recently assessed an environment with four forests and they had such complex inter-forest relationships that I felt like I was watching a soap opera trying to map out who had rights where in order to determine, and it just got to a point where I said, okay, you have a user account that's over here that has admin rights over to this forest which then its administrators group is now over in this forest over there, it gets complicated. And that means that any one of those forests gets popped, all of them do. Had another customer that had ransomware just ravaged through their Active Directory forest. And they had other forests. And they said, well, we're so glad we had separate forests. I said, but you have two-way trust between all your forests. That, that <laughs> ransomware was just very bad. It just wasn't smart enough to look because it could have just taken over all of them. So there's things that we can do to isolate these, these, these environments and protect them better. Because ultimately we want to build the best defenses. And so I put these together as defensive pillars. So we have our administrative credential isolation and protection. We have hardening our administrative methods. We have reducing and limiting service count rights and effective monitoring, which I don't have time to cover. But it is important. Um, so we want to make sure that we're isolating and protecting these. And one of the best things to do is the things that we talk about forever is, is separate AD admin account from our user account, separate AD admin account from other admin accounts. So that way we're not putting those AD domain admin credentials on a whole bunch of systems because we need to manage SQL, for example. And one of the best things you can do is use distinct naming. I did an assessment of one organization and I went through and I said, what's your naming standard here? Because I'm seeing all these random things. It's like uh, initials, first initial, middle initial, last initial, and then first name, last initial, and then uh, first name, last initial, last name, first initial, all over the place. And I said, well, what's your standard? He said, ah, do that so the attacker doesn't know <laughs> who the admins are. So that's great, but I have this report here that lists out all of your Active Directory admins, and I don't know which accounts are supposed to be there. So you're just making this more complicated for yourself because the, the attackers aren't going to be confused through this level of obscurity. They're just going to go, oh, it's Dave. Yeah, that's the domain admin account. So where's Dave? Oh, he logs on over here. OK, sure. I can do that. So we want to make sure that we have distinct naming. Why is this important? Because we can programmatically and automatically identify if an ADA account logs onto a workstation. Hopefully, we're monitoring and pulling back those logs. But we can identify that. We can identify when an account is logging on where they shouldn't. And hopefully, we're also using technical controls like group policy to prevent them from logging onto those systems as well. But short of that, we can at least identify when they are. We can also use this to identify when a non-ADA account gets added to a group that it shouldn't be because someone made a mistake. 
And we can track through that mem group membership recursively and go ADA, ADA, oh wait, there's an SA account here, what happened? Where did our process break down? This way we can ensure that we know who's a member of what group and should they belong there, at least at a, at a point. And then we have controls around those ADA accounts, like putting all the ADA accounts into an ADA group and then using group policy to deny logon for all of our other systems that those ADA accounts shouldn't log on to. But I probably spend most of my talk, time talking to customers about this. Why are admin workstations important? Hopefully at this point in this presentation, we all have a good idea of why they are important. Ultimately, we have moved from the, from the stage of uh, we need to protect our uh, and, and set up these really strong boundaries for our perimeter to our workstation is where the battle is being fought. And we already know that there are a lot of accounts that have access and administrative rights to our, our regular workstations. And we know that people jump from those uh, to, to other systems. And the, the issue with agents is that if they can install and run code, they typically have admin or system rights. And hopefully they're not running as a service account that's a member of domain admins, because that would be a really big problem. So just a little while ago, Swift on Security put, put, uh, tweeted this out and said, funny how all the ransomware stories in the news didn't impact employees who weren't on the uh, VPN. Users are safer at McDonald's than connecting to most of your enterprise networks. Why is that? Why is that? That's because we have flat networks and it's too easy to jump from one system to the other because we haven't set up the controls that we need to. We're at a point now where we need host-based firewalls on all our workstations. There's no need for one workstation to connect to the other. Oh, but Sean, we have printers that are shared. Okay, buy some network printers. I'm sorry, they're like 500 bucks or 500 euros. Um, that, that's where we're at now. We need to get to the point where we block the default open access that we used to have. Uh, most of us don't work at universities. I worked at a university before and they had a very open policy. They even changed that in the past number of years because of the fact that the, the threats have changed. They've gotten more complex. It's more difficult to protect the environment now with an open policy. So we want to make sure we isolate and protect these privileged credentials. We have our 80 admin accounts. We need to know, um, actually just a show of hands, who here knows 100% where all of their domain admin accounts log on to in their network? Okay, so like five, six, okay? That's part of what we need to figure out in order to better identify this. Things like Bloodhound will help us identify where accounts are logging on interactively, but they don't always tell the story about who, where someone is RDPing from to, which is another uh, second, second factor consequence of this. We want to make sure that we have a secure administrative environment for our admins and that they're forced to use it. Because ultimately, the common attacker playbook is chapter one, we drop on this workstation, we dump the credentials, oh look, we have a domain admin account. Or oh look, the same local admin account and password are on all of our workstations. And then we just spread out and then we move from there. So we want to make sure that our admin, our admin accounts can log on to this, to this special system, but with not, no admin rights. So when we're talking about an admin workstation, we want to make sure that we limit these and protect these better than, than what we do with everything else. When we have an admin workstation, we want to look at this and hold this up to our highest security standard. We want to firewall them off. We want to protect that, that network communication. We want to make sure that just any random system on the network can't just connect to it and ask it for some information. And one of the most important things you can do is enforce NLA for all RDP sessions. This is the thing where when you're doing an RDP connection to a system, it pops up that little box that says, what's your username and password? Why is this important? There's a number of really well-known and understood uh, persistence methods for leveraging um, accessibility options like UtilMan and some of the others where all you have to do is RDP to the, to the system that you had before, NLA is disabled, you just hit shift five times, it pops up a system box. It's like movie hacking, it's brilliant. But this protects against that sort of thing. And we wanna make sure that we protect our systems as best as possible. And of course, MFA is very important as part of this hardening process. So raise your hand if you've seen this before. Keep your hand up if you feel like it is feasible, can be implemented, and or you have implemented this fully. I am impressed, I am very impressed. 
that there's, uh, there's a couple of hands that were mostly up for this because this is very difficult. Um, usually when I show this slide or talk to customers about this, I, I see them mentally doing this. <laughs> it, that's a problem. This is like the key way to protect our environment and no one can do it. This is what Microsoft has on their website today under securing privilege access. So I'm going to simplify this and let's go from this to this. Let's focus on our tier zero. Let's focus on our domain admins. Let's focus on our domain controllers. Let's focus on our Azure AD Connect server. If you have, if you have Office 365, you probably have Azure AD Connect. And it's very likely you've enabled password hash sync. If you've enabled password hash sync, your Azure AD Connect server needs to be protected like a domain controller because it's requesting the password hashes from the domain controllers in that domain every two minutes. And they flow through and then they get hashed again to be sent up to Office 365 and Azure AD. These are the things we need to protect. ADFS, Federation, needs to be protected at this level because your ADFS servers are your domain controllers for all of your cloud access. So focus on tier zero because that will give you the, uh, the most value for what you're trying to do. Like I said, it's very difficult to do this. Few have actually implemented. I know of only a couple of organizations that have. So let's not focus so much on all of it. Let's focus on the things that are going to be the most critical, like protecting our AD admin accounts, protecting our domain controllers, protecting our Azure AD uh, Connect servers, protecting our ADFS servers, and all the other ones that, it, that get captured in that section, in that area. So tier zero, like I said, it's all of those things that are a critical infrastructure. Anything the passwords are flowing through. Um, this could be any system that is handling your federation, as I mentioned, or your PKI. We want to make sure we protect these at a very high level because of the risk, the threat of what happens when these get compromised, any of them. So the challenge I have is convincing admins that admin workstations are in critical because oftentimes, who are the people that have to implement these? Like literally say, here's the configuration, here's the workstation, set up everything in AD, it's our AD admins. And they are less than thrilled to hear that they have to do something that's going to add more to getting a ticket closed or getting work done. So we have to talk to them, work with them in a way that's going to be very collaborative. We have to talk about what the threat is. We have to talk about what's possible. Uh, the Microsoft Surface devices are nice, small, lightweight. They work great. They support all the Windows 10 security features. I don't make anything from Microsoft by saying that. Um, but I, I like the systems. That's a nice second system in order to be the, the admin workstation. Uh, I've talked to customers about some other ways that they can configure this so they can have an admin system that's workable in their environment. But then the other part of this is management has to be convinced. Tickets are now going to take 20% longer. It's going to take longer to get these things solved. It's going to take more effort. We have hardware costs. But here's the thing, all of this is cheaper than recovering from a breach. Because FireEye, CrowdStrike, all of the IRs, very expensive. And many organizations have to pay them a retainer just in case stuff happens because of their insurance requirements. The retainer is still cheaper than having to go through the breach. Because then, you're, then you have all of your staff, some of your best people in your organization working 80 hours, 100 hours, 120 hours a week for however long it takes. And then once the breach is over, they go back to their 9 to 5 or, or working their 60 or 70 hours to try to do all the recovery stuff. So when we talk about convincing management, this is an important part of it because we need to get to a point where we have a workable admin system. Separate physical devices is, is best but we can use a virtual system in order to get that working, in order to get it implemented. We don't want best to be the, the, the enemy of good. We want something better than what we have today. And so with a virtual environment, we can have the host OS as the admin environment, and the user environment is the VM on the system. So we can have one system where they're able to do their administration as well as do all their user activities. Um, and then they're going to log on to the system using a transition account, as I mentioned before, that doesn't have any rights on the system. Um, in some instances, you could even use that admin, admin account, uh, depending on the configuration, and then manage your environment from that system by using RDP to connect to your admin server. 
So there are challenges with this, but effectively this is what it looks from a visual perspective. Regular user account logs onto the user VM, transition account, or in some cases the admin account. But ultimately your AD admin account is going to RDP into your admin server. This way we can isolate and protect our credentials, and we don't want to reverse this scenario where we have our admin workstation in a VM and our user environment in the host, because then we're sending privileged credentials through an untrusted environment to get to a trusted environment effectively. But if you use a password vault, same type of scenario, uh, regular user account, transition account, which would then connect into the password vault to then connect to the admin server. Again, hopefully MFA to the password vault through RDP. And so when we're talking about our admin workstation deployment, we want to make sure we start with 80 admins. Virtual infrastructure is extremely important. Don't forget about VMware. You have virtual DCs. Who has administrative rights to your VM environment? Who knows the root password for your ESX hosts? Are they different? Uh, these are things that have to be thought about, again, about who has access to the systems, uh, cloud admins, server admins, workstation admins. And then PKI and mainframe admins need admin workstations too. Those are also critical parts of the infrastructure. But focus on phase one, your Active Directory admins. Because this is the new standard for AD admins. They only ever log on to domain controllers, AD admin workstations, servers, keep them separate from everything else, and no service accounts with AD admin rights. Because service accounts are one of our biggest problems in our environment. I would, I would argue that they probably are outside of AD administration. Uh, there are members of admin groups that have too many rights. I've read through a lot of uh, product documentation, and this is kind of what you end up seeing in all the documentation. They need domain user, domain admin, system rights, AD privilege rights. And I found that the, the, a pattern emerged as I was reading through the, all this documentation. I, my eyes started to blur that there was one thing that they all said that they needed, and hopefully you can see the pattern too, because it jumped out at me that they all want to be a member of domain admin. And there's some common ones, a vulnerability scanning tool. I hate that vulnerability scanning companies don't make it easy to have separate accounts for separate scans for different classes of, of systems, workstations, servers, domain controllers. I always get scared when I see one vulnerability scanning account domain admins. Please don't do that. Uh, backups, VPN, for some reason a VPN account was put into domain admins. Why? As it turned out, after asking a lot of questions, that way if the user's password expires, then the VPN service account can change their password on behalf of the user when they type in the new password. You can delegate that. It doesn't need to be a member of domain admins. And then of course SQL. There's never a good reason for SQL. Oftentimes someone will install SQL as a domain admin so it can update the spins. No, you don't need to do that. So in conclusion, the traditional AD administration methods have to evolve with what we're seeing. Our priority is going to be removing our accounts and service accounts from AD privilege groups as much as possible, clean those up. And priority number two is protecting and isolating our AD admin credentials by ensuring these credentials are limited to specific systems. We know where they are, we can monitor for them, we can track this. So I'm gonna have the slides up later on presentations.adsecurity.org or you can go straight to adsecurity.org. Um, but that's been my time, thanks so much for yours, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you much, Sean, for your great oversight. Uh, questions? Hi there. Um, my name's Steve, and one of the questions uh, that I have is, what do you consider the significance of CICD system of systems as it relates to the tiered model of critical infrastructure in that they interact with secrets, credentials, source code, and also uh, cross logical security boundaries? Should they be t tier zero? Um, that's a great question. I'm not, are, are you talking about the systems that have, I, I heard source code and some of the others. I'm not familiar with that term. Um, so like a Jenkins-based CI-CD pipeline that interacts with Git um, and then uh, builds various uh, elements and then promotes them across one security boundary to staging, then on to production. I would think so, yeah. I mean, it, when you're talking about a system that is automatically generating and configuring an environment which is going to be used by a large number of users, the other thing is there's, there's companies that have source code. Um, the other interesting thing is that there's financial companies that write their own 
applications that then manage all of their financial systems. It's one of those things where you look at what the system is, you look at what the risk is if it's exposed, and then make the decision and determination of at what level do we need to protect, protect this? What would happen if an attacker gains access to this? How can we protect it? So tier zero is a concept, um, but ultimately we've had these sort of things before in the US, PCI, things along those lines elsewhere, isolating them, protecting them. I think the concept is the same and can be reused. Uh, certainly looking at the risk and what the threat is against that is the best way to determine uh, what the best pathway forward is. And of course, the most important thing is management buy-in. I worked with an organization that where every user could do whatever they wanted. They were developers. They, could, they had full admin rights. Um, they didn't have good tooling. They didn't have good monitoring. And basically, management said, no, we can't have this anymore. If we get hacked, our reputation is out the window. And in just a matter of a year or so, they have gone from nothing to one of the best I've seen with security tooling, controls, tracking, management. I mean, they're very solid. So it's one of those things where management has to understand what that risk is as well, because the developers are going to complain. And we have to be able to counter that and say, OK, I understand your concerns, but this is what the risk is. This is what we need to do to get this to a better place. Further questions? Hi, my question is about passwords. What would you do to protect um, people from using the same password on different, um, yeah, like DA and, and SA account, as we call it, and the standard Corp ID account? Uh, it's a great question. Um, one that, that doesn't have a simple solution, unfortunately. Um, I think password auditing is probably the best way to go with that. But I have some concerns about the, the, the traditional password auditing method, which is where you basically take a copy of the DIT, you put it onto another system, you go through and crack it or check it. Um, there's a few interesting things that have um, been configured that I've seen, excuse me, where be effectively you have a system that pulls DC sync um, password hashes and goes through that and, tr and uh, checks them out. Um, there's not, I, I don't feel like there's a really great solution for that um, other than password auditing and uh, it, Actually, one, one way that you can help limit that is using fine-grained password policies on your privileged accounts and giving them a 16 or 17 character uh, password minimum. And so on your domain, you're going to have whatever it normally is, 7, 8, 10, 12, hopefully 14 or 15. Uh, but that way, there's less, less likely they're going to use the same password if there's different um, password length requirements. That's probably the, probably the easy button for it. Um, sorry, there's not a better answer that I have. I think Microsoft, uh, even in the times of Windows NT, provided uh, a pass DLL mm -hmm. that, uh, that performed some checks. But uh, this never worked so good. But there are some companies that uh, offer these. But um, as you said, uh, uh, Yeah, the password no filter can definitely check against known bad passwords or ones you don't want. Uh, and then Microsoft released over the summer the Azure AD password protection, which is a supported tool by Microsoft. The, you install the agents on your DCs, and you install an agent on a server. It pulls down from Azure AD the known bad passwords, and then it does some um, intelligence around that, so that way users can't use really bad known, pa known bad passwords. Uh, that updates on a regular basis. It's a password filter. Um, they, what's I interesting about it is it leverages uh, a effectively a group policy. So they create a group policy entry into Sysvol, and that's where they update the, the password data that, that pulls down from Azure AD. So it replicates around all the DCs. The DC checks against that uh, whenever a user changes their password. That doesn't solve the problem of two users using the same pro password, though. Um, but you can have custom banned passwords through that as well. So you could type in, uh, I don't know, Heidelberg, and then it would do the automatic checks against uh, lead speak and other uh, character substitutions of Heidelberg uh, to pre protect against that. So that's an option for bad passwords, but again, doesn't solve the problem of one user using uh, the same password. <laughs>